Parker? Can you hear me? We can hear you, thank you very much, that's great. I don't have a PowerPoint, so you're not missing that. Um, great, I'll start then. Yeah, the title of my paper um, is the text of Codices uh, Bobiensis, also known as VL1 or K, and Palatinus, also known as VL2 or E, in Mark 12, 37 to 40, 13, 2 to 3, 24 to 27, and 33 to 36. Representatives of the four main old Latin text types, according to the Vetus Latina, are attested together in just two places in the Gospels, in certain verses of Matthew 12 through 14 and Mark 12 and 13. This fragmentary intersection of texts is created by Lacuni in the so-called Old African and Recent African text types, represented respectively by VL1 and VL2. In Mark, VL1 begins at Mark 8.8 8 and continues to the end of the gospel, while the continuous text of VL2 begins at Mark 1.20 and ends at Mark 6.9, except for brief fragments in Mark 12 and 13, where these texts overlap. It has long been recognized that in certain places, the text that survives in VL2 incorporates later elements, particularly of the Italian text type, which is unsurprising given the fifth century date and Northern Italian provenance of the manuscript. At the same time, this text is cited as a distinct stage in the development of the version that arose sometime after Cyprian, but before the early European text type through a fresh consultation of Greek texts of a so-called Western tradition. But how are we to determine which elements of the text belong to the third century and which elements to the more, are more recent? How are we to discern which readings derive from the four laga and which belong to the translation event? And if either of these points is in question, how are we to claim that this text represents a distinct stage in the, de in the development of the Latin version? Bonifatius Fischer alluded to such questions when he remarked, to assess rightly the testimony of the Latin New Testament for the Greek text and its variants, it is necessary to pay attention to the history and evolution of the Latin Bible. It is evident that not all differences within Latin play a role here, but only the specific contact which has taken place with a Greek text. Fischer calls attention to the crucial problem of distinguishing material introduced by translators, editors, and copyists within the version from material that derives through contact with Greek texts, as well as the need to consider this material in light of the history of the version, that is, to consider it first in a versional context before turning to the Greek tradition for an explanation. In this paper, I consider the fragmentary intersection of VL2 and VL1 in Mark 12 and 13 focusing on what it can tell us about the recent African text as represented by VL2, including the nature of its relationship with the old African text as represented by VL1 and its development of this earlier text. In light of the problem raised by Fischer, I inquire as to the extent to which these developments arose through contact with Greek texts versus internally within the version. I suggest that it is misleading to regard the so-called recent African text as a third century translation, representing a distinct stage in the development of the Latin version for at least two reasons. First, in our fragment, there are no readings where VL2 diverges from VL1 that require contact with Greek texts. And second, occasional parallels with so-called Western Greek texts elsewhere in Mark typically follow patterns that reflect the method of the translators in places where no Greek model exists, suggesting that these readings too arose in translation by contact with a so-called Western text. It is possible then that the producers of this text performed no new Greek translation, but simply edited materials that already existed in Latin, and hence that its principal contact with Greek texts to the extent such contact may appear necessary is through other Latin gospel texts, including possibly the Vulgate. If so, the so-called recent African text type represents an old African text revised to agree in certain places 
with contemporary late fourth or early fifth century readings found in the Italian text and the Vulgate, rather than a distinct early stage in the development of the Latin version. Retransmission of the Old African Text. When we encounter extended verbatim parallels between VL2 and VL1, the most economical reconstruction is near, nearly always that the recent African translators simply took over material from the earlier stage of the version. Thus, in Mark 12, 38 and 13, 26, 27, and 34, VL2 transmits significant portions of the text found in VL1, though sometimes this material is also transmitted by later stages of the version raising the question as to whether the recent African text has been at least partially impacted by these later stages, given the date and provenance of VL2, our only witness to this text. Therefore, our best evidence that the recent African text rests on an old African base consists of mutual agreements between these texts against the rest of the Latin version, where we occasionally find the support of other African or mixed African witnesses. For example, in Mark 13, 2, VL2 and VL1 agree with two other African witnesses, Cyprian and VL6, with the addition of in templo after relinquiter against all other Latin witnesses. Yet despite the significant number of exclusive agreements between VL2 and VL1, these witnesses diverge nearly as often as they agree. Some of these variations are likely attributable to third century development of the African text, but others are likely attributable either to later traditions or to the editorial work of the producers of the text found in the fifth century manuscript VL2. Changes assignable to translators, editors, and copyists. It is clear that Latin translators, editors, and copyists sometimes introduced changes to the version as they found it without reference to Greek texts in the interest of producing a text that was more accessible in translation. We find evidence of this in the recent African text in Mark 13, 27, where VL2 attests the plural collegiate for the singular collegiate in the rest of the Latin version, apparently because the plural noun angelos is closer to the verb than the singular filium hominis. By referring to the more immediate subject or noun, the effect is a text that is more direct and easier on the reader without significant change of meaning because in the context, angels are the agents of the son of man. Other small variations can be similarly understood as the work of editors operating within the version, such as the substitution of the plural salutationes for the infinitive salutari in Mark 12:38 the pronoun hic for he in Mark 1240, the conjunction altem for et and the verb form dixit for digit in Mark 13.2, the near synonym virtutes for fortitudinous in Mark 13.25, the addition of the demonstrative ista after vidatus in Mark 13.2, and the addition of enum after nesitas in Mark 13.35. Such variations require no source in either Greek or Latin to explain. They support a model of the recent African text as a revision of existing Latin texts motivated at least in part by considerations of style and usability. A second potential source of inner Latin variation is assimilation to synoptic parallels in other old Latin gospels. According to Jerome, copyists within the version routinely assimilated the text in front of them to whichever of the four gospels he had read first or to the version he values most. We find evidence of such assimilation in the recent African text. For example, in Mark 13, 25, where the addition of de Chilo after Steli, not found in VL1, appears to assimilate to the same phrase in the Old Latin Gospels in Matthew 24, 29. Similarly, the repetition of Amen in Mark 13, 2, appears to assimilate to the Johannine formula Amen, Amen. The reading we considered above in Mark 13, 27, where VL2 attests the plural collegiate for the singular collegiate may reflect an attempt to produce an easier, more direct translation as we noted. But it is also possible that it assimilates to the plural form of the verb in Matthew 24, 31. If any of the above readings 
in VL2 arose by assimilation to synoptic parallels, this likely occurred entirely within the version by reference to Latin translations of the parallel text, whether by memory or by direct consultation. In the case of the text preserved in VL2, a third source of inner Latin variation seems to have been later stages of the Latin version, particularly the Italian text represented in Mark by VL 4, 5, 8, 13, 14, and 17. Attested first in the latter fourth century and linked to Northern Italy through citations of writers such as Ambrose, this text would presumably have been available to the producers of the text we find in VL2 based on the date and prominence of the manuscript. Evidence of such a connection exists, for example, in Mark 1238, where VL2 agrees exclusively with VL8 with docebot against dicebot in VL1 and exclusively with VL4, 5 with salutationis against salutari in VL1. In Mark 1240, VL2 agrees with VL4814 with ocancione against excusatione in VL1 and with VL4581314.17 in attesting orantes against VL1, which lacks it. Certain readings in VL2 may reflect the influence of the Vulgate. For example, in Mark 13.3, VL2 agrees with the Vulgate in attesting the plural olivarum against the rest of the Latin version, which attests the singular olivetti, while VL1 simply transliterates the Greek tonaleon as though it were a proper name, eleon. It is possible then that VL2 obtained this reading not by direct contact with Greek texts, which also have the plural, but indirectly through the Vulgate. Readings in which VL2 agrees with Italian witnesses or the Vulgate against the old African text preserved in VL1 suggest that while its base text may represent a third century African tradition, the text as we have it has appropriated materials from contemporary traditions within its Northern Italian provenance. Changes assignable to contact with Greek texts. With a grasp of the complex interaction of potential sources and influences on the, on the recent African text within the context of the version, before we even consider Greek texts, we now turn to the question as to the nature and extent of Greek contact, aware that contact with Greek texts must compete with alternative explanations, including inner Latin editorial change, assimilation to parallels and other old Latin gospels, influence of the Italian text, and possibly influence of the Vulgate. In the introduction to the Vetus Latina edition of Mark, the text of Oath of 032 is singled out as a potential Greek source of the recent African text as preserved in BL2 on the basis of a series of remarkable parallels. One such reading we have already considered in Mark 1327, where VL2 parallels 032 in attesting the plural collegiate for the singular collegiate in VL1 and the Greek mainstream. But we have already seen that this reading might also be attributed to inner Latin editorial change by attraction to the plural noun angelos in the immediate context or by assimilation to the synoptic parallel at Matthew 2431. Is it more plausible here that Latin translators and editors simply drew on existing Latin texts readily found in the context in which they worked, or that they consulted an eclectic Greek text as we find in 032 for a mere change in the number of the verb. If we weigh these alternatives first in the context of the version in which they appear, it is difficult not to see the former as the more likely scenario. Examples can be multiplied in which inner Latin change supplies the more plausible explanation for a reading in VL2 that parallels 032. In Mark 125, VL2 renders the circumstantial participle legon in the Greek mainstream with the coordinate clause et dixit in Latin in agreement with 032, which attests ke ben. Before we conclude though that VL2 depends on 032, we should consider the context of such readings in the version where it turns out that this preference for coordinate clauses over circumstantial participles is a common substitution among the singular readings of both the recent African and old African texts. 
Thus, we find the same kind of substitution in BL2 just four verses earlier in Mark 121, as well as in 334, where there is no extant Greek model. This pattern occurs with even greater frequency in the old African text, where we find, where we find 24 cases in the singular readings of VL1. It is likely then that the coordinate clause in Mark 125 was introduced by the translators, and hence that the agreement with Sierra 32 is coincidental, at least on the Latin side. In Mark 1, 41 to 43, VL2 agrees with 0, 032 in the omission of the entire phrase, a catharisti ke embrimisamenos afto, as found in the Greek mainstream. Here, 0, 032 omits the additional phrase, exevelon afton, supplying a clue that VL2 could not depend on its text or at least not the text presently preserved in 032. But before we even consider the Greek text, we should observe that such omissions are common in both of our so-called African texts, where the translators were evidently comfortable abridging the text, and particularly in compressing various forms of parale parallelism as we find here. For example, in Mark 4.2, VL2 is our only witness that truncates the second half of the sentence, he taught them in many parables and spoke to them in his teaching, presumably because it was considered sufficient to mention that Jesus taught in parables without adding that he spoke in his teaching. The omission of, of short phrases in parallel is even more frequent in the old African text, where we find 15 examples among the singular readings in the absence of any Greek model. So the omission in Mark 1, 41 to 43 is consistent with the habit of the African translators to abridge the text by truncating parallel phrases. Given that the omitted text consists of two coordinate verbs in parallel with a third coordinate verb at eh it, it is clear that the text of 032 is unnecessary to explain the reading of VL2 in this passage. A number of readings shared by VL2 and 032 exhibit the kind of reworking of the Greek text that we expect in translation, while lacking an analogous explanation in a Greek text such as 032, suggesting that they arose during translation rather than having existed previously in Greek. It is difficult to see what these readings accomplish in a Greek text, but in Latin they make sense as attempts to render the Greek text effectively in translation. An example of this is the preference for the infinitive predicare for the Hina clause Inake eki karikso in the Greek mainstream in Mark 1.38, for which we find the parallel karisin in 0.32. But substitutions of verbal nouns for clauses and vice versa occur with some frequency among the singular readings of both VL1 and VL2, readings most likely assignable to the translators and hence requiring no Greek text to account for their development. It is quite common to find African readings that simply rephrase the Greek text using alternative words, diction, and word order, a rather mundane occurrence in translation. We should pause then before reaching reflexively for the Greek tradition where alternative, contextually sensitive explanations exist, namely the activity of translators engaged in conveying the Greek text in a manner that was more understandable, more natural, and ultimately more usable in Latin, with the means at their disposal, who often exhibited significant ingenuity in rendering the Greek and Latin according to identifiable habits, priorities, and stylistic preferences. This is more necessary when we consider that every distinctive African reading, recent African reading that differs from the old African text in our fragment has multiple possible explanations. As noted above, the reading collegiate from collegiate in Mark 1327 might be explained in terms of inner Latin editorial change, assimilation to synoptic parallels, or contact with Greek texts, while other readings in our fragment can be explained in terms of influence of the Italian text or the Vulgate. Some readings, such as Salutationes for Salutari in Mark 1238, might be explained in terms of any five of the above possibilities. Close examination of our fragment reveals that in no case is contact with Greek text the only possible explanation for a reading in VL2 that diverges from VL1? And given the weight of the context in considering alternative possibilities, seldom is it the best explanation. On the other hand, 
we should expect the influence of Italian texts to be a constant possibility, given the fact that this text prevailed in the historical context in which the text preserved in VL2 reached its final form. The predominance of Latin texts in this context, the relative insularity of the Latin version in this later period, and the breadth of alternative explanations encourages us to be somewhat parsimonious in our assignment of any of these readings to direct contact with Greek texts. In our fragment, Greek readings are simply unnecessary to account for any of the differences between the old African and recent African texts. In conclusion, one way to understand the recent African text is to view it not as an African text of the third century, but as a fifth century text of Italian provenance constructed on a somewhat older African base, whose representation in Mark extends to just over half of the text that has come down to us in VL2. The crucial question is whether any Greek texts were consulted at all in the development of the newer text, since we find that the habits of the so-called translators frequently render any contact with Greek texts entirely unnecessary, whether in our fragment or elsewhere in Mark, including the remarkable series of parallels with 032. It turns out that these parallels between VL2 and 032 consistently follow patterns attested in the singular readings of both VL1 and VL2, readings most likely assignable to the translators and editors, such as the omission of repetitious and parallel phrases, epexegetical asides, tangential details, material implied in the context, and connecting narrative within dialogue, along with a preference for simplicity, directness, and alternative renderings of Greek words that slightly change the meaning of the original. We find that in accounting for variation in VL2, the text of 0 to 32 as we have it is essentially superfluous. In our fragment, we considered a range of possible explanations for recent African readings that diverge from the old African text, including inner Latin editorial change, assimilation to parallels in other old Latin gospels, influence of the Italian text or the Vulgate, and contact with Greek texts. We found that many of the readings in which VL2 diverges from VL1 have multiple possible explanations, underscoring the complexity of the problem in ascertaining the origins of the recent African text. When we consider the numbers, inner Latin ed editorial change can explain 38 of 40 readings where VL2 diverges from VL1 in our fragment. Influence of the Italian text or the Vulgate can explain 24 readings. Contact with Greek text can explain 20 readings. And assimilation to parallels in the Latin gospels can explain 15 readings. With so much ambiguity and so many potential vectors of change, it is clearly impossible to discern with any degree of certainty how a particular reading in the recent African text came about, except where there is complete agreement with the old African text, in which case it can be presumed that the reading was simply taken over from the, this earlier stage of the version. Significantly, in no case is contact with Greek text the only possible explanation for a reading in VL2 that diverges from VL1 in Mark. Given the date and provenance of VL2, our only surviving witness to the recent African text, it is distinctly possible that the only contact of this text with the Greek tradition occurred indirectly through the Vulgate and through witnesses to the Italian text, which themselves may depend in part on the Vulgate. A plausible reconstruction of the recent African text then is that its producers were impressed by the antiquity of the old African text, which they adopted as a starting point to which to add contemporary elements of the Italian text with which they were familiar. In a parsimonious reconstruction, it is likely that the final producers of the recent African text as we have it consulted no Greek text at all and possible that, that they did not even know Greek, in which case it is more accurate to refer to them as editors than translators and the product of their efforts not as an early stage of the Latin version, but as a singular example of a highly mixed late Latin edition of the Gospels. Thank you, Pete. Sure. So I see applause happening in various windows and I will invite questions um, the same way as before, either by using the 
the actions function to raise your hand um, or simply by typing a message in chat. Right, we begin then um, with Christina. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me put my hand down again. Thank you, Pete. Um, I, I may ask a, a tiny little question concerning something that you said at the beginning of your paper, uh, where you had the, those um, different forms that were changed in Mark, and if I remember correctly, they were usually verbs, and then you said something like that all those changes were not so surprising or something that we would expect or know from other changes. And I think there was one where you said salutaciones uh, instead of the verb, I don't remember exactly. And all the other oh, ones as well. Yeah. yeah, so, um, and the other ones were more like tenses or yeah, tenses, I think mainly. But wouldn't yeah. we say that the change between the noun and the verb is a greater one than between verb only or tenses only? Because to some extent you're changing the category of the verb, the word or does that not count? Good question. Um, as with many things with this problem, I mean, we don't really know. We can't, we have to, I mean, we have to try to put ourselves in that context and being an editor or translator. Um, I, the only thing I would say is I doubt that they were thinking in grammatical categories as much yeah. as um, <laughs> what makes sense or what sounds better in their, to their fifth century yeah. ear. Um, so, but good question because all this is open. And I mean, when I say not surprising, I mean, I'm ready to be surprised because <laughs> there's always new evidence and new ways to look at things. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah I agree. There's so much to explore. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks very much. I have Jeff Jenkins next in line. Um, thank you for your pa paper, Peter. Um, I, uh, thinking about uh, the various ways in which the Gospels in various forms and various languages can influence each other, it's striking, I think, that Matthew seems to be, in Greek at least, uh, the most textually static uh, and to have influenced the other Gospels. Um, and we think we know why that is, because Matthew was the most popular text in the early church. And there's an irony in it, isn't there? Because uh, Matthew borrows from Mark and then no sooner has he done that, then his gospel text starts influencing Mark backwards. Uh, I wonder whether the same could be said for uh, the Latin gospels. Presumably not Matthew, although I'm only guessing, uh, but that, that it's, it's clear, perhaps it's clear that one of the gospels is dominant, uh, perhaps the earliest one translated uh, over the others. Are you, are you asking that or is that? I'm asking, yes, yes, I'm wondering. So I'm asking. Well, um, I, I think that's an, I, First of all, I think it, it may be the same situation in Latin as in Greek, but um, I will point out that the Latin Gospels are um, often given in a, a different order. And Matthew is first, followed by John, then usually Luke and Mark. So I think what you're saying is, is certainly supported by what I've, what I've read so, and seen. And, and also in the readings that we saw in many cases, in the recent African text, they do parallel um, where, the, where they differ from the older African base. They do happen to parallel Matthew in, in many cases, the, the Messian parallel. So um, it could be argued that Matthew is the cause of those readings. Although I will also point out that we have to consider that there are other reasons for almost all of these variations. But yeah, good point. Thank you. Thank you. In the absence of any other obvious questions I can see, I'd like to ask you a bit more about what your see your conclusions as being in terms of methodology, because you started off by being concerned that the, this, this reconstructed type C um, doesn't, can't be substantiated by Greek. And therefore, is the concern that it shouldn't be reconstructed as a text type? Or 
um, is it still acceptable? I mean, I, the thing which I see, the, the, the aspect of the text types, which is different in the Gospels to elsewhere, is that we have so many early manuscript witnesses to the Gospels that we don't have elsewhere in the Bible. And the, when the text type categorization was brought in, it was on the basis of patristic rather than on manuscript material. So I wonder whether there's still a case for the text types um, from a patristic point of view. And in essence, manuscripts might be um, inconsistent witnesses here. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a great point. I think um, I, I um, tend to follow the Latin text types and I, that's a good point that they do. Um, I mean, they're because otherwise we can't place them without having patristic data. So, um, I, so I, I would agree with you that I think there is a case for a recent African text. I'm just saying that um, maybe um, it seems that VL2 is mixed, a very mixed version of that, especially in some places. Uh, I think it's worse in Luke than in Mark. Um, but um, there are, but on the other hand, it, it most often agrees with the old African text. So, um, and I think I mentioned it was almost, it's about, you know, in, in the fragment, about, it depends how you count an agreement, but it's like 60% of the time it, it does follow the old African text. So, um, and in, in that case, the, the, the problem is what do we do with the stuff that doesn't match, right? And so, um, so to, to look at it from the point of view of the text types, I, I think, um, it was Sande that that pointed out that it, it does seem to be later than Cyprian. So he has that table in somewhere in one of his um, monographs where he lists VL1 on the left, Cyprian in the middle, and then the VL2. He looks at the same passage I looked at. And it's pretty clear that um, if you were to draw a line, VL2 does seem to be in that category. So there, I think there's a a, there is a justification for that being a text type, um, but I, I would just um, want to caution that I wouldn't want to. I, it's, so there's all, the problem is, what do we do with this new material where it doesn't agree um, with either Cyprian in this case or VL1, and um, that material doesn't necessarily have to be third century. And given that we find evidence in other places of what appears to be the influence of later traditions, then it seems like um, we maybe should be cautious about that text type, or at least about claiming that we have that text type or have access to it. So I guess it'd be more of a question of access than whether the text type in theory exists, um, because it makes perfect sense that the African tradition would be developing and there would be multiple streams of it. I mean, we have, you know, just where Cyprian parallels the old African, it's clear they're not identical. So um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. I, yeah, it, it goes some other way to addressing it. It makes me wonder whether it would also be helpful to look at say text type I as well in the same cases to see whether in text type I you're getting the same thing of sort of 50, 60% agreement with, with the earliest text and then a different set of variations coming off and the extent to which you could be confident that text type I, um, the variations in that could be explained with reference to the Greek or simply with internal reference to changing Latin yeah. practice. So, I mean, what you've shown in terms of getting the information together for text type C, which is a bit unusual, but we have so much of this text type extant um, in a single, or, potentially in a single manuscript. It would be interesting to compare that with the other full text type we have at this point, which I think is I and also D to an extent, um, mm -hmm. although D is very complicated anyhow, um, to right. see whether they're all coming from the same source and the extent to which anything actually involved a revision based on Greek before Jerome came along. Right. Because yeah, otherwise, otherwise I'm worried that you're going to say if you did discover the division that seemed to have a Greek base in text type C, you said, oh, well, it's 
copied about the same time as the Vulgate. So it's probably Jerome who's coming along and making this change here. And I'd just be interested because I'm not sure that there has been a study to try to pin down what the what the Greek differences that underlie the Latin text types might be. As you say, you know, you, you can put you can put the fear gospels, you can put Gregory Allen 032 across the top and say there's a lot of readings here that look like they parallel Latin. It's not causal. They weren't necessarily in this particular form that they um, that they have this parallel with Latin tradition. But nevertheless, um, these readings do seem to match um, a lot of what's going on in Latin tradition for whatever reason that might be. Right. Yeah, there's definitely definitely a desideratum for more work that looks um, at the what I, what I would say is missing, and where the desideratum would be is considering the Latin. And I, I know um, Burton's study was actually really good for considering the um, version on its own terms, but um, it's more linguistic, but maybe a more textual um, study like that would get at those questions. Super, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions based on that or further observations that people would like to make in the general session? Um, Georg, yes. Um, happy yes, to hello. thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Peter, for your paper. Um, I have a question that perhaps I, uh, I may put like this. Um, I suppose you have an agreement between Palatinus and Washingtonianus. Um, in your view, what would be required for you to say this is not coincidence or this is uh, they are not independent? Is there anything that would you that would convince you that these that this agreement must be due in some way to um, a genetical relationship? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this gets out of very, um, thank you, Gary. <laughs> you asked like the question that I was afraid someone would ask. Um, <laughs> so, <sorry. laughs> I, so thank you. Now this has to be asked because um, I, I don't believe they're coincidental because they're too coincidental. Um, um, so you, actually, and the, the examples are too, um, there's one example in Mark 13, um, 3, 17 to 19, which maybe you know about, uh, where it gives the list of the apostles. And the list, and it's clear that these are the same, they, they have access to the same tradition. Mm. It's too coincidental that they would call. Um, so both texts, um, so in the, in the mainstream text in that passage, um, it's the, um, it introduces uh, Peter, and then it introduced James and John as the sons of thunder. So both the recent African texts in 032 call, they, they removed James and John's names there so that all 12 of the apostles are called the sons of thunder in both of these texts. So that is too coincidental in my opinion to say that there is not some relationship there. All, my, my only point is that I would not assume that the Greek came first in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and perhaps can I can I follow this up by saying um, there are probably many cases where we have more than one option, and and my question that occurred to me while you were presenting was um, suppose we have an agreement that allows for more than one explanation. Um, it appeared to me as if you were arguing something like. If appeal to the Greek tradition is unnecessary to explain the phenomenon, then, uh, well, let us not appeal to it. But how do we know that this is necessarily uh, the best idea? Should there not be some sort of um, taxonomy, may I say, of probabilities? Is it not possible that we can say, okay, we, we it could be coincidence. Mm -hmm. The Latin editor or whoever it was may have omitted this, but perhaps the alternative explanation may be more plausible. And um, instead of simply adding up all the places where a given explanation is possible, uh, say from 
parallel inference or whatever it is, should we not look at every single instance and ask what is the balance of probabilities? And I think the longer, for example, a variation unit is, uh, the more difficult it seems to me to say uh, completely independently, two different people arrived at the same measure. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that. So I, I'm, I, I believe that somehow, um, I think 0 32 is the problem here. Mm. And I don't have an answer to it, but um, it, it seems that that is another thing. And how the uh, Latin green readings got into Greek is way beyond the, the, the scope here. But yes. the problem is that, um, um, and, and also my background is Codex Beza, and so I have um, more knowledge on that side. And mm. and it seems clear in that case that Latin is the source of the Greek parallels. And so I have a little bit of a bias that I would sort of disclose to everybody. <laughs> uh, but it, but I have no knowledge of year 32, which is what I, so um, yeah. I'm beyond what everyone else probably has here. So um, all I would point out is that, uh, you know, what I'm arguing is that if this, type of variation occurs like dozens of times in the singular readings, but then one time that same thing happens and 0 32 happens to agree. It just, mm. it makes no sense to say that everywhere else they did it on their own. And in this one place, they looked at a Greek manuscript. That, mm. So that's my basic argument. I, I okay. agree though, that it's nothing like certainty. Um, mm. um, it's just, and, and it's more, um, in a way I would argue that, um, in a way, my argument is sort of a pushback <laughs> against what I see as a an assumption that we just always assume that the Greek text yeah. is where it came from. And so, and so yeah. in some sense, I'm, you know, taking the, the contrarian position on purpose um, yeah. because obviously they came from four login that were Greek. And so, um, but I, I would just push back that we, we need to look at the verse, and this is where I, you know, I cite Fisher because I think that's an awesome point that he brings up that we, we really, before we just say that the, the readings match and therefore the Greek is the source, let's look at the version and understand what the translators were doing. So, and mm -hmm. let's try to describe um, their patterns of, it's still sort of like one is abridging things that are parallel, this, this happens in many places in, in the African text. So, um, and in many ways, so like it, it, it manifests itself where, it, so some of Jesus' sayings in Marx are, are presented in like a, a synoptic parallelism form where he says the same thing and then the same thing. Um, and sometimes there's um, a development. And so a lot of, and, and it, there's at least three places where the recent, the old African text and the recent African text just omit part of Jesus' saying because the second part parallels mm -hmm. the first close enough that they thought they didn't need both. But it also yeah. finds out, it, it, you know, so there's all sorts of these types of patterns um, that we, we need to understand before we can do the taxonomy and the probabilities. Okay. That, that, that's what I would be arguing. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> thank you. No, thank, thank you for the yeah. clarification there as well. Yeah. I think I shall...